Hello, my name is Marcia Spink, and I'm the Associate Director for Policy and Science in the Air Protection Division of EPA Region 3. And this is Clean Air Act 101, Module 3, Air Toxics, and it's coming to you from the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards in RTP. This is an overview of the Air Toxics Program, Section 112 of the Clean Air Act, and Title 3 of the 1990 Clean Air Act Amendments. So what is an air toxic? They're also known as hazardous air pollutants, or HAPs, pollutants which may reasonably be anticipated to result in an increase in mortality or an increase in serious, irreversible, or incapacitating reversible illness. So how do we regulate air toxics? Well, we've talked about criteria pollutants in earlier modules of this course. For the criteria pollutants, EPA sets the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Areas are designated attainment or non-attainment. States develop state implementation plans or SIPs to attain and maintain the standards for the criteria air pollutants. And EPA approves the SIP to make them federally enforceable. But when it comes to air toxics, federal rules are developed based upon risk and delegated to state and local agencies. A little bit of history of the air toxics program. Now, prior to the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, the Clean Air Act of 1977 required EPA to set standards for each toxic air pollutant individually based upon its particular health risks. This approach proved difficult and minimally effective at reducing emissions. EPA was required to identify all pollutants that cause serious and irreversible illness or death and had to develop standards to reduce emissions of these pollutants to levels that provided an ample margin of safety to the public. Between 1970 and 1990, EPA regulated only seven pollutants, asbestos, benzene, beryllium, inorganic arsenic, mercury, radionuclides, and vinyl chloride. And this was due to complications of the risk assessment process. In the 1980s, many states developed their own air toxics requirements due to a lack of progress in EPA regulations. Now this slide provides you an idea of what are the sources of air toxics. Admittedly, it's from the 1996 National Toxics Inventory, but it does show you that major stationary sources account for about 24% of air toxics emissions, smaller area sources and other sources such as forest fires for about 26%, and mobile sources for about 50%. Accidental releases, which also contribute to air toxics to the atmosphere, are not included in these estimates, at least not in this slide. The 1990 Clean Air Act amendments dramatically increased the authority EPA has to regulate air toxics. We have regulations for area small sources and small source categories that pose an undue risk. The requirements and the authority can be found in the Clean Air Act in Section 112. There's also a list of major source categories with a schedule for regulation. And the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 listed 188 air toxics that we were to regulate. That list is now down to 183. Five of those chemicals have been delisted. Now, when it comes to major and area source control of air toxics, it's a two-step process. We do controls first, and then we have to assess the remaining risk after we've adopted control measures. Now, the controls are technology-based standards, and they're known as Maximum Achievable Control Technology, or MAT. After we impose the MAC standards, we will assess the residual risk and then promulgate risk-based regulations. Setting the MAC. EPA's MAC standards are based on the emission levels already achieved by the best performing similar facilities. When developing a MAC standard for a particular source category, EPA looks at the level of emissions currently being achieved by the best performing similar sources through clean processes, control devices, work practices, or other methods. These emission levels set a baseline, often referred to as the MAC floor for the new MAC standard. At a minimum, a MAC standard must achieve throughout the industry a level of emissions control that is at least equivalent to the MAC floor. EPA can establish a more stringent standard when this makes economic, environmental, and public health sense. The MAC floor is established differently for existing sources and new sources. For existing sources, the MAC floor must equal the average emission limitations 
currently achieved by the best performing 12% of sources in that source category if there are 30 or more existing sources. If there are fewer than 30 existing sources, then the MAC floor must equal the average emission limitation achieved by the best performing five sources in the category. For new sources, the MAC floor must equal the level of emissions control currently achieved by the best controlled similar source. Whenever feasible, EPA writes the final MAC standard as an emission limit, meaning as a percent reduction in emissions or a concentration limit that regulated sources must achieve. Emission limits provide flexibility to the industry to determine the most effective way to comply with the standard. We also have something called area sources, and again, these are the smaller sources. And area sources are also controlled under EPA's urban air toxic strategy. Now, the urban air toxic strategy includes the development of max for area sources, meaning again, sources less than 10 tons annually of a single hazardous air pollutant or less than 25 tons or more annually of a combination of hazardous air pollutants. The goal of the urban air toxic strategy include to reduce the risk of cancer by 75% and to substantially reduce non-cancer risks associated with air toxics from commercial and industrial sources. The strategy also reflects the need to address any disproportionate impacts on sensitive populations including children, the elderly, and minority and low-income communities. EPA is required to identify a list of at least 30 air toxics that pose the greatest potential health threat in urban areas. And for the strategy, EPA actually identified a list of 33 such air toxics. EPA was required to identify and list the area source categories that represent 90% of the emissions of the 30 urban air toxics associated with area sources and to subject them to standards under Section 112D of the Clean Air Act. Through three separate listings, including a list in the urban air toxic strategy, EPA has identified a total of 70 area source categories which represent 90% of the emissions of the 30 listed air toxics. Of these 70 area source categories, 28 had been regulated by June of 2007. EPA was sued for the delay, and EPA was put on a court-ordered schedule to issue the area source rules listed under the urban air toxic strategy. The remaining categories were grouped with deadlines completed by June 15th of 2009. Community-based programs. Community-based programs are an integral part of the air toxic strategy. They assess local risk. As part of the program, you work with the community and stakeholders to reduce risk by voluntary and other measures. And we also provide compliance assistance, outreach, and education. I'll just give you some examples. Many of the area sources of air toxics and small sources include things like dry cleaners. Several of these businesses are often run by minorities, so we produced our compliance assistance and educational materials in their native languages, such as Vietnamese, Korean, etc., and a number of other languages. The 2001 Mobile Source Air Toxics Rule, MSAT. Section 202 of the Clean Air Act requires EPA to set standards to control hazardous air pollutants from motor vehicles, motor vehicle fuels, or both. EPA published a rule under this authority in March of 2001 that established air toxics emission performance standards for gasoline refiners and committed to additional rulemaking to evaluate the need for and feasibility of additional controls. Now that led to the February 2007 Mobile Source Air Toxics Rule. This MSET was revised to significantly lower emissions of benzene and the other air toxics in three ways. First, by lowering the benzene content in gasoline, by reducing exhaust emissions from passenger vehicles operated at cold temperatures, and by reducing emissions that evaporate from and permeate through portable fuel containers. The 1990 Clean Air Act amendments also called for a National Air Toxics Assessment, or NADA. What this program resulted in was an improved monitoring network. There's a national screening assessment. It's an emission inventory. We do ambient air quality modeling, exposure assessment, and risk assessment. And we also have localized risk assessments. So here's a summary. 
Air Toxics program was amended in Title III of the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990. It expanded our authority under Section 112 of the Act. The old program that regulated toxic air pollutants found at 40 CFR Part 61 NESHAPs was greatly enhanced by the MAT controls that are codified at 40 CFR Part 63, again pursuant to the expanded authority under Section 112. And we also had the mobile source requirements that came from the MSAT rules promulgated pursuant to Section 202 of the Act. Other laws and regulations that govern air toxics. Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know under EPRA, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA or Superfund, and the, under Superfund, of course, you talk about accidental release reporting, toxic release inventories, and emergency response plans. Other laws and regulations also include RECRA for incinerators, boilers, industrial furnaces that burn hazardous waste, controls and leak detection for large quantity generators and treatment storage and disposal facilities, Toxic Substances and Control Act or TOSCA, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act or FIFRA. All of these additional regulations have impacts on controlling air toxics emissions. RECRA regulations for hazardous waste combustors are being phased out and will be handled by an air regulation promulgated under the Clean Air Act. Some air and RECMA regulations overlap, so coordination is going to be necessary. This concludes Clean Air Act 101, Module 3.